All right. I want to thank all of our fellow veterans and um, those that service our veterans on this uh, Zoom call today, um, which was uh, initiated by myself, Mr. Doug Keeler, and um, Chris Kirsten, and I'm going to have to work on that, um, her, her name, as well as uh, my associate administrator, um, Mr. Randall Jones. And we're just going to have a few uh, remarks from him before we kick this off. Good morning, everyone. To start, I want to personally thank all of you for your sacrifices and everything that you do to protect our country. I also want to thank our partners, Fort Hood USO, for this virtual training seminar and allowing us this opportunity to be with you today. Although I have not served in the military, I've been an admirer of the USO for many years and certainly appreciate the service they provide in helping our brave service members. The workshop today is designed to allow us to help you, and we hope ultimately you can help us. What do I mean by this? Well, as you choose your next career, we hope that you will consider joining the Agricultural Marketing Service and becoming a team member with us. We not only need you, but we also want you. If you're a veterinary technician or a culinary specialist, then you understand our grading commodities and could easily be one of our next commodity graders. However, I suspect that many of you are not a vet technician, but not to worry. We will and we can train you. We offer a great apprenticeship program. We're also looking for many different skill sets to fill many different jobs, such as contracting specialists, budgeting officers, investigators, warehousemen, accountants, public affairs specialists, chemists, biologists, and many more. So before I close, I wanna let you know how serious we are about hiring vets. When I first became associate administrator and chief operating officer, Veterans is made up about 3% of our hires each year. I am happy to say though last year, vets made up 21% of all the hires. I am committed to exceeding that number and helping you and your journey into your next career. So as I conclude, I also wanna thank the AMS team that made this seminar possible and I'm confident that you will find them most helpful. After today, I highly encourage you to please reach out and contact any of these team members and I promise you that you will get a response and you will get the help that you're looking for. Thank you for being with us today. Back to you, Charmin. All right, thanks, Randall, appreciate it. Um, Kristen, that's your cue. So I just wanted to say thank you all for being here. Um, to enjoy this wonderful presentation from um, AMS and the USDA. Um, Doug and Charmin have been a longtime partner of ours, coming, visiting Fort Hood, um, making the big trek down from Washington, D.C. to present this workshop in person um, last fall. So after that success, um, given the recent pandemic, we have been able to bring same incredible workshop right there to your living room today. So um, thank you for being here. If you have not heard about the Pathfinder program, we are the USO's Transition Services Program. So we provide assistance with employment, whether that's your resume, interview skills, um, and your education aspects, continuing education with those certifications, whether you're looking for PMP, Lean Six Sigma, HR, IT, all of these marketable skills that you can then bring to AMS and a wide variety ranging from VA home loan questions, support, and all of these resources we provide to you are transferable across the country. We have 20 locations, um, so we are everywhere just like the USDA is. Um, our services are open to active duty service members as they prepare to transition veterans and also military spouses. So we are truly here to continue serving those service members and their families just as the USO does. If you have any questions or would like to join the Pathfinder program, you can reach out to me 
um, on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way right now, um, as well as visiting USO.org. So it's www.USO.org slash Pathfinder. So look on the screen, write down Pathfinder, um, and then you're gonna, going to want to connect the Scout today and choose the location that is closest to your area. Fort Hood serves all of um, North, Central, and East Texas and extending out to Louisiana. So you may be in Dallas, but Fort Hood will still be able to take care of you. Thank y'all all so much for being here. Thank you, Randall. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Charmin. Um, and enjoy today's workshop. All right. Thank you. Doug, did you want to um, have anything to say before we get started? Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, no, I not, not right now. I have some things at the end that I'll say, uh, but I just want to say, well, maybe just a, a quick welcome. We love our partnership with USO, and many of you may have seen me around the uh, around the uh, uh, the installation there back last year, and we look forward that once this pandemic is over, we will be back. We will be back, and as I said earlier to those that joined early, we are looking we are looking forward to our partnership, and we're. And I'll be sending out some, um, um, a couple of jobs that we just received in uh, so that you can enjoy those. My watch is going off, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you, Charmin. You're welcome. All right, I'm over here. I'm, I'm technical assistance and presenter all at once. Um, so um, please forgive me. So we're gonna, I'll just give you guys just a little bit about me. Um, I've been with uh, AMS for five years, was brought on board to help out with the Affirmative Employment Program, which is in our Civil Rights Department. Um, to help increase our numbers in our underrepresented areas. And because I am a retired uh, vet, I get the um, privilege of working with the vet program to increase the numbers and work alongside of our leadership in order to find ways that we can bring um, more vets on and be that employer of choice. So, um, you know, it gives me an honor and, and a privilege to be able to present to you all today um, because this is just a, one way that I can stay connected to um, our service members. And as uh, my leadership has already mentioned, if there's anything that we can do to assist you in helping with your transition to make it a um, smooth for you, because it is indeed a cultural mindset shift, we are here for you. Um, you know, um, I have this saying of, you know, we go to boot camp, they strip, of, strip us of all of what we, uh, you know, come in with, and then they build us back up. And then, you know, we get about, a week to go to transition assistance class um, if you have that um, opportunity um, and, and some of us more uh, seasoned ones may, may not have had that opportunity but then um, in order to go out uh, into the civilian sector it, it is definitely a cultural mindset shift that needs a little bit more than than a week to prepare so these um, I also have my um, my co uh, presenter um, Mr. Joe Joseph Allen, um, he is an HR specialist and he will be tag teaming in on this presentation as well to add um, his flavor from whatever I may um, miss or whatever additional information he can give you to provide you with the best tools and tips that we can give you. So today we're gonna go, these are our learning objectives. So we're gonna be learning about how to market yourself in writing, how to format your, the federal, your federal resume, how to best articulate your experience with words, learning how to communicate your skills, learn as what you um, have um, while you were serving, and how it's relevant um, to what the hiring manager is looking for in a candidate. Um, the federal government um, has made it very easy and quick for us to be able to, um, to connect the best candidate with federal jobs, and that is by way of usajobs.gov. So hopefully everyone um, has, um, is familiar with usajobs.gov, and if you haven't, I would um, advise you to really become familiar with that tool 
um, that they allow us um, to use in order to submit our applications. So um, this workshop, like I said, is going to cover the, the, the writing um, practices, the best practices for writing an effective resume that highlights your strengths and accomplishments. And I have to say, for, for me, um, you know, I'm going to be referencing myself because I think I'm, I can be very relatable. Um, Doug, if you can, you know, chime in as well. Um, but the, the whole transition and writing a resume and being able to go from, from we as a team to me, it was really challenging. So um, we're going to go through this, um, um, this, this process, but I just want you to get into the mindset of going to what, you know, it's with them, what's in it for me. So this is all about you right, right now, this resume writing um, uh, uh, session. So the next three slides. So, so are, excuse me, Sharma, if I, if yeah. I could, I'd like, um, as you were saying, you, you're, she's absolutely right. Um, I went through the process about 14 years ago when I retired, and it was, you know, um, you are literally, you know, on the edge of a rocking chair, like a long-tailed cat, and you think that, you know, you can't do it. But you, can, I want you all to know you can do it, you will do it, and if you follow through on this, you're gonna be successful. And you will all get jobs after you leave the military. Um, you may not think it now, but you are going to do it, and you can, you can do it, and you are going to do it, and we're here with you. So uh, it was tough, and it's, it, it is mind-blowing, but once you get used to it, you'll be on that next chapter. All right. Question. Yeah. And these next uh, three slides provide an overview for the section of your resume. So first is you know, the job announcement um, number series grade and promotion potential um and then Ms. Charman question question yes C senior airman Cifuentes uh, air force um is this is this uh, uh information available somewhere so I we can you know do it later on Oh, like uh, which most, what are we talking about right now? Most definitely. Um, I will uh, send uh, Kristen the um, PowerPoint presentation, but um, I have to tell you that my friend, um, there's a there's a link to on USA Jobs. If you Google USAJobs.gov, um, it will. There's a resume writing um, workbook that is out there. So that will go over this information as well. But I will definitely give this presentation to Kirsten and she can um, send it out to the email list that she has, if that will work for you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Okay, um, if you have not already registered via Eventbrite, please do so, because I'm going to send the PowerPoint presentation to that list. And yes, I can, uh, put, the, I I can I, put the event right in the chat. Correct. I, I registered already. Then you're good. You'll get it in an email. Thank you so much. Sorry sure. about that. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so as I was saying, these are the sections of your resume um, that we're going to go through um, for the next three slides. So your personal information, you know, your mailing address. And one thing I want to note here is that you really need to have a professional email. You don't want to have a, your pet name as your email address as you're looking for, um, as you're sending out your resume. You want to have a really professional um, email address. Like mine is charmanrickards at gmail.com. Um, you know, it's not, you know, any pet name that I may, somebody may have called me or some you know what have you so just want to make sure make note on this particular slide to make sure that you have a um, professional email address and that it's current um joe i just want to um, um see if there's anything that you wanted to add in on on this nope uh, uh, i'm good Okay. All right. The next slide, um, like I said, this is your education and, um, and your skills and your volunteer work. 
as military members, sometimes we, we do a lot of volunteer work. And so you have your, I used to say volunteerism is employmentism. It gives you the experience and skills that you, you may, you can use in um, applying for some of the jobs. Um, you know, it's like OJT, for instance, you know, on the job training. Um, you may go and work somewhere um, as a volunteer. I know when I first uh, came in, I volunteered um, at the clinic in Barbers Point, Hawaii, just to get experience as a hospital corpsman before I went to A school. So again, that's just one example of, of you know, your volunteer work. And I know as, as military members, we do a lot of giving back to our community. So if you, um, you know, have um, organized a Habitat for Humanities event, um, then that is something that you need to articulate on your resume as a skill um, that um, you have, an experience that you have. As well as your, the, the, your applicable skills and, and certifications and association memberships. Um, there, I know for the for the Navy, we have Petty Officer Association, Chief Petty Officer Association, and if you hold any leadership positions within that, you need to be able to articulate. You need to articulate that into your resume as well, because again, that those are skills and attributes that you have um, when you're um, in those particular positions, as well as. If you volunteer to be um, your child's uh, summer league softball or, or, or a soccer coach, those are also um, skills that you can use in order to um, make yourself a lot more competitive when you're um, writing your resume. Any questions? Sharman, this is Greg Jones. I've got a question for you. So on the previous slide, it said um, you were talking about the education piece. Are the the total credits required if you obtain a degree? Um, no. Um, let me see if I can go back to that slide. Um, it's um, you. You want your your graduation dates. I didn't um, put on my um, resume credits. I put on there my graduation dates or my anticipated graduation dates, if you're anticipated on graduating. So if you anticipate, you know, so it's a, so those are the dates. Um, I'm not sure about credits, um, but Joe can um, maybe speak to, towards that. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, <clears throat> positions that, um, there's various positions that you can qualify based just solely on education. Um, when you're applying, um, it's helpful to have the information in your resume, but also you're, you're gonna be required to submit transcripts. So the transcripts are what we're gonna actually go off of to verify um, the credits and your GPA to determine grade levels. Um, so it's helpful to have that information, um, but you don't necessarily have to have the credits in the actual resume because you're going to have to provide your transcripts as well um, from an accredited college. And then we go through and depending on the position, some positions do have um, positive education requirements such as economists. So that's where we're going to be honing in to look at um, you have a degree or a related um, degree for a type of position, but there's specific courses that they require, like 24 semester hours of certain courses and then one course of statistics. So we're gonna review your transcript to verify those credit counts. Um, so going back to the resume, having the actual credits on the resume is not gonna matter. We'll need that supporting documentation to verify. But I, I would add one thing, uh, thank you, Joe, to that is that if you have a GPA uh, above a 3.0, that goes into what we will call superior qualifications. And so you absolutely, if you have that 3.0 or greater, you want to have that on your resume uh, to show and to give you that chance at superior qualifications. Um, and uh, 
you also have an opportunity because we're, you know, we're going to look, we're looking at trying to qualify you as a veteran, but you also have another thing that you can, a uh, program you can get in school, it's called a recent graduate. So if you're, if you graduated within the last three years from college, whether you're a veteran or not, you know, now you're eligible for the recent graduate program as well. A am I off on that, Joe, or? Um, it it's two years. Um recent grads are two years. However, if okay. you are active military uh, called up, um, I'd have to read the actual guidance, but um, certain active military actually, if you get deployed, you actually get up to six years. All right. All right. Well, Great. So thank you for that. I just a wanted question, to, um, does it yes. matter if it's graduate degree or um, postgraduate? No, um, it doesn't matter. I think it just, you know, um, when you're listing your education on your resume, it doesn't matter whether it, it, it is a graduate degree, associate's degree, or, or what type of degree. What matters, but what we're going to get into is that you're going to have to read the announcement and what the requirements are for that particular job. I'm sorry, let me cl clarify. For the recent graduate um, program, does does the degree level count? Um, Joe, do you well, want to, um, answer that? Yeah. So it's again, it's going to depend on the grade level, of the position. Um, it it really goes by the position. So most recent grads, um, I want to say, on the GS five level, would require a bachelor's degree or four years leading to the bachelor's degree. Um, and I can go into specifics, um, provide that extra information after the presentation. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. So now we're going to go into um, some resume writing tips. I want to say, you know, we want to focus on um, so, so much. Sometimes we are so focused on just getting a job that we may not identify what type of job that we want or what industry that we want to work in. So I would strongly advise you to try to set some type of objectives to your, your job search based on your skills that you have acquired over um, the course of your military service. Um, and we have a plethora sometimes of, um, of skill sets. And I'll just use mine as an example. I came in undesignated in the military. Um, so it was with a VP squadron, as well as went on to be a hospital corpsman, did leading petty officer, um, things in that, that realm, uh, worked in inpatient, outpatient, and then went on and got commissioned. So there's a lot of, and then we have all these collateral duties that we do. So there's a lot of experience that we have. So when you're looking for a job, you want to put your, 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 your identified organizations in pockets where you can focus on tailoring your resume to that specific job. Because, you know, as you notice in this picture, when you go get a tailored suit, it fits you and, and it doesn't fit anyone else. And that is what you want to do for your resume. You want to make sure that for every job announcement that you are looking at, that you read it in its entirety and you tailor your resume to that job announcement. Um, and I'll have to share that I was just, I did one job. When I started my search, I did one resume, thought I was in like Flynn. And I was just clicking apply on everything. Apply, apply, apply. I thought, you know, that was the, my, my, my objective is just to keep applying. They're, they're going to hire me. I'm a vet. That's the mindset that I had. Oh, I'm a lieutenant commander. You know, I've done 22 years. Oh, all I got to do is just get it in front of them. So I'm going to hit apply, apply, apply. But I needed to be a little bit more strategic with my, um, with my search and making sure that the organization fit me and um, as well. So just wanted to add that, that in um, because just as the hiring manager is looking for the right candidate for the job, you should also be taking the time to look for an organization that's the right fit for you as well. And we at AMS is the right fit for you. Um,
sorry, I'm just reading this. Um, someone just sent a chat um, message to me. Um, I'm gonna take, what I'm gonna do, if, if you send it, I'll take pauses and then I'll look at the chat box if they're sent to me privately. Um, I was hoping that my team, um, Doug, if you guys could see those chats, are you able to see those chats? So for the chat- I, I'm question, on it right now and I'm answering one. Okay, all right. So you guys are, you guys are good? Yes, yeah. you just keep okay. going. All right, well, I won't, I won't look at the chats. I'll continue with the presentation. Um, so as I was saying, you want to ensure that just as hiring managers are looking at you, you need to also look at organizations to make sure that you're the right fit as well. Um, along with um, your, your skills and experiences that best match those vacancy announcements. Um, and, and this way you can focus on knowing what is appropriate and relevant um, for that given industry and that, give, and that position. Um, you also want to review your resume, um, every aspect of your resume, um, asking how does it make me a good fit for this position? And if it doesn't, consider moving it out. And as I said, you want to um, also think of tailoring it, um, like I said, with the picture, because no two companies are the same. Um, and as it relates to us, no two departments are the same. And what I mean by departments, when it comes to uh, the federal government, we have the Department of Defense, we have the Department of Agriculture, we have the Department of Commerce, and even within the Department of Agriculture, we have several different agencies within our department, and not all of them are the same. So you wanna make sure that when you're looking at the different um, job announcements that you're really paying uh, close attention to what is required of it and to um, customize your resume for each job. And you wanna um, emphasize your strengths and make sure that when you're um, writing your resume, you wanna make sure your knowledge is, your knowledge, skills, and attributes are relevant to that announcement. And we're going to look at an announcement um, a little bit later. Does anyone have any questions? Joe, do you have anything to add? I do not. All right. It's okay. All right. And, and of note, you know, I have down here that do not copy and paste um, your job description. One of the things that Doug and I do is we review resumes when they come into us. Um, we give a courtesy. And what I see so many times is that we cut and paste our job description. And we're going to get into this a little bit more in the workshop, but please do not cut and paste your job description and put it in there because we need numbers and percentages, cause and effect. And the last bullet, if you're currently serving in that position, then it is, um, you know, it is not past tense. But if it's you've already served, then, of course, it's provided. And then, like I said, it's provides and serves. So you want to make sure those tenses are correct when you're going through and you're reviewing your resume. And you want to focus on overlapping experiences and educations that um, you have that is described in the job opportunity announcement um, because it, you, you may have some things that are overlapping. Um, you wanna be um, concise but detailed. And we're gonna uh, go through a couple of examples. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples um, from uh, how it was concise but it provided detail at the same time. Uh, in the, if you, in the USA Jobs, there is templates that they go through that provide headlines. And so what I've been accustomed to is I just filed for any federal resume, I would just use USA Jobs template in order to make sure you get all of the, um, the points that they're gonna want you to have, like, um, you know, and the headers um, for the um, HR specialist that they're gonna be looking for. There's like a simple format that they're just gonna be looking for. And then again, as one job um, announcement, one resume is not gonna fit each job. So you have to look at the job competencies in the specialized areas. And 
this last bullet talks about going back at least um, 10 to 15 years. For me, when I went back 10 to 15 years, that was an 18 page resume. So again, clear and concise really needs to be um, honed in um, on. I just was putting everything, the kitchen sink in there. Any little thing that I did, I was putting it in my resume as I can recall from my I Love Me binder. But that wasn't specific for that job that I was getting. So I needed to hone in on what is the specific job and what skills do I have or I need to reword in order to articulate it best for this job. Hi, Charmin. Yes. This is Kristen. Yes. We have a message or question from the group. Should regarding education, should, should GPA be a qualification section listed with education or other information at the end of the resume, their GPA? Um, I put in my, I put the GPA and I'm, I'm gonna let Joe also answer this question, but when I did my resume, I put cum laude and sum cum laude in my, at the end of my completed degree. Um, so that is where I place my grad, my um, GPA at in the education section, but if it's any, but if there, Joe can add to this, if there's something different. And Joe, before you hop on there, let me just say that, and this, this is why I sent a note out to everybody that you will, as a key point, what Charmin said earlier, you're gonna have more than one resume. You're gonna have your main one, and then you're gonna take from it, and you're gonna tailor the one that you want uh, for the job that you're looking for at the time. You know, you're gonna wind up having, you know, 20 different types of resumes for particular things. So what Sharman was saying, what she does with her GPA, her and where she put her uh, cum laude, uh, I put mine that under awards. However, I list my GPA next to uh, the degree. So uh, you see how we do it differently, and it fits. It fits both ways. It'll fit either way. The point is that you want to get if your GPA is above a 3.0, you absolutely want it on your resume. If you graduated soon, cut sum laude or uh, cum sum laude, you want to put that under awards or just somewhere in your resume so you, you're recognized for it. Now, over to you, Joe. Yeah, definitely having that in the resume, there's no, um, from my experience, there's been no strict, like it needs to be in a certain section. Um, it definitely does stand out when you see that. Um, but again, um, applying to jobs, we're going to we're looking at your resume for that specialized experience, that relatable experience. And then if you're, um, if I see that you have your GPA, there's education on there, I'm gonna look at the grade level, the type of position, um, because again, some positions you can qualify strictly solely based on your education. So if you have a bachelor's with 3.0 and above, um, and I'm hiring for a GS7, um, I'm gonna look, and see, did you supply your transcripts? I'm gonna look at that transcript for that GPA and that confer date. Um, the official, when you're applying, it can be unofficial transcripts, but before you can enter on duty, we have to have the actual copy of the official transcript. So having the information on the resume is helpful, um, but we're gonna need that transcript as a supporting documentation because that's gonna, that's what's actually gonna qualify you. Um, and that's what we look at to either qualify you based solely on education um, or take that combination of experience and education um, into account. All right. Um, so, so the next slide, we, we talked about um, doing like an extensive inventory. So like my 18 page um, resume was that extensive inventory didn't know that at the time but that was everything in the last 10 to 15 years that i had did um while i was on active duty but i just want to talk about some skills that fall into three categories and how they show up in your performance of um appraisals if you will so the self-management refers to the way that you you manage yourself on the job and you'll see words like dependable resourceful hand selected, things of that nature. Functional is used um, on the job as well um, as in your previous jobs. And they show up as, for functional, as 
operate equipment, supervise, analyze. And then your more technical one are skills that are required to perform a, a described task. And that will show up in words like um, computer programming, accounting, sales, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of one that's relevant to, you know, uh, logistics, um, uh, office um, assistance, automation type stuff. So those are just some of the three categories of self-management, functional, and technical. So this is a screenshot of what USA jobs look like. And this is for an executive summary, um, not executive summary, an executive assistant. And I wanted to show you this because um, one, um, they are changing this to be a lot more user friendly. It didn't look this way um, two days ago, actually. Um, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation didn't look this way two days ago. We had some older stuff, so I updated it to where it looks, um, what the, the, the tool looks like today. And so you can stroll over and you can see the overview, the location, duties, requirements, required document, benefits, and how to apply. But if you stroll down, you will um, see those same things. So you can um, go to them automatically but you can also, you can go to them by clicking on them here or, but if you stroll down, they will, um, you will see them. And then over here is really a new tool is where it says this job is open to. And so down here, military spouses and veterans. And if you click on that, it will give you an explanation of, um, of what veteran, um, uh, hiring initiative you're able to come in under. Um, Excuse me, Charmin. Yes. But we, we have a quick question. Uh, they'd like you to go back and go over the three types of resumes um, again. I, okay, I didn't go over. Th these are the three types of skills. And it's self-management skills, functional skills, and technical skills. And some example words that you'll find on your Performance appraisals um, will be like dependable, resourceful um, for self-management. Functional is going to be um, operate equipment, supervise or and analyze. And for more technical is going to be like um, Microsoft um, Office proficient, accounting. Those those things that really need more. Um, you know, more, more, um, you know, I guess, uh, uh, certifications, if you will, or going through a class or showing that you really have those, you know, they're more technical in a sense where you have to show that you have that knowledge. So computer programming, for instance. Um, so is that, did that answer their question? Uh, I believe so. I'm not getting the comment. All right. And I, you know, and I, um, again, once we share this presentation with you, if you go and you Google, um, like self management verbs and functional verbs and technical, you will, it will come up with a plethora of things. I was looking for, there's this uh, guide that we used to use um, when writing uh, resume, uh, not resumes, but performance appraisals, and it had like good, better, best. Um, you remember that, um, uh, Doug, the, the resume, it's like a little blue uh, binder, like little slender binder that we used to write um, that has like adjectives and, and verbs in it to help us articulate our uh, the, the fitness, The fitness and, and appraisal writing guide. There you go, that's it, right? Yep. Yeah. So, so many of you that are, um, if you've written appraisals, you know, we, I'm sure we have some officers on the uh, on the line. You know, uh, of course, Charm and I have been out for a minute or two. So, <laughs> I, but I think that book is still out there, and that has some very good. What she's talking about has some very good phrases that you can put in your resume. But if you listen to, if I want to key in on a couple things that Charmin is sharing with you, 
is going back to you in the Marine Corps. We call them fitness reports. Um, and on the Army, I know you have rating officials. Whatever your rating official, when, uh, every year when they're writing your appraisal, there are some keywords and key accomplishments that they're writing about you that includes metrics. And I focus on, and I think Sharman does too, and we review your resumes and send put input back to you. We tell you it's, it's really a lot about your accomplishments and putting those metrics, dollars, percents, uh, time saved, you know, seconds, days, wh whatever, and getting those in there. And on your duties, only about a paragraph. Don't write and do that cut and paste thing on your duties. Uh, put about, I say, three to four sentences or one paragraph on your duties, and then start with the most important, the biggest accomplishment and the accomplishment you were the most proud of during that time of duty, when you had that duty or that job. That should be the very first one, the eye catcher, and then start listing the other ones. But make sure it includes metrics. Right. So, so I found the book. I, I, I knew I had it, but it's called Effective Phrases for Performance Appraisals, The Guide to Successful Evaluations. It's this little blue book. And in here, it just gives a whole bunch of um, phrases. So as a, as a leader, Charmin, can, make sure I... Uh, can you show it up one more time, Charmin, and just hold it up there so they can see it? I'll also send this out to um, Kirsten as well. Kristen. Kristen. Um, and this may be an old edition, but I bought it on Amazon and I may have some other ones around here too. So, um, but yes, always needed to, um, to see how I can um, not make the one sound like the other. <laughs> Um, the job announcement, um, on, we just talked about earlier and I'm going to go back over what are some critical areas of the job announcement. So this here is the job announcement right here is an announcement. Um, please forgive me for the, for the, for the small font. I just, this is just a screenshot of the job announcement, but on here you have the, um, this is very important open and closing dates. And I would highly recommend that you go in and you really get familiar with usajobs.gov website because you can set up where um, you can have job announcements that are filtered that will come directly to your email once they are announced. Um, so here, you know, this one was announced on the 7th and it closes on the 21st. So you can, you know, um, manage your time a lot wiser um, if you know what your deadlines are. And here's the pay grade section, service, which is competitive, which talks about the, this makes it competitive over here. And then this is your salary range and then work schedule. Um, and then each one of these have um like the location um which is here on this slide like this particular one was in germany it also tells you if it's telework eligible you'll find that information here in the location section and if there's any if they're offering any relocation reimbursement expenses you will find that here as well um and then the next one is duties and responsibilities and then requirements Right, so here is very important. So again, if you look at the top, you see the overview, location, duties, and requirements. So now we're, we actually, I actually strolled down to get this screenshot for you, and I'll just read you some conditions of employment. It says a, for this particular position, it has a two-year trial and probationary period may be required. And then appointment, may be subject to a suitability or fitness determination. And what that is, is your overseas screening. They wanna make sure that if you go in over to Germany that they have the capabilities to take care of any medical needs that you may have. So they wanna make sure it's sort of kind of like a, 
it's not really a fit for full duty, but it's a fit to make sure that the, the uh, healthcare facility can take care of any um, of your current uh, it, uh, um, health needs that you may have. And then of course they do a completed background check here as well. So this, these, like I, it would behoove you. I don't, I'm not gonna say this over and over again, that you read this in its entirety. I didn't read this in its entirety and I probably missed on, on a plethora of opportunities because I didn't have the right documents in. I didn't put them in on time. And you also have um, contact information on here. You may have an email and I didn't do a screenshot on here, but um, there may be some um, HR specialists may provide their email contact where you can email them a question. And so don't hesitate to um, ask questions as you go along the way. Um, if there's something that you, um, you know, you're, you want to, you know, you don't understand um, or if you want some clarification. Again, this is how you will be evaluated. Um, it's great to know how you're going to be evaluated because then you can look in here um, to ensure that you have all of what is required um, to be the best candidate for the position. They're telling you right here. So, um, you know, and it says minimum qualifications, right? Minimum. Doesn't say maximum, it says minimum. So don't talk yourself out of a job, let someone else talk you out of it. If you could, because if you meet the minimum qualifications, you should apply. Because you may have, you may meet the minimum qualifications here, but they may be looking for someone that has leadership skills. And we already know that just by joining the military, you know, that we, um, by being in the military that we, um, they train us up to be um, leaders. Any questions? All right. Actually, uh, Sharman. Yes. Hi, this is uh, Darren Colonna from Fort Hood. Um, I, I wanted to just thank you again for clarifying the uh, minimum requirements because that's something that you know I've kind of wrestled with a little bit. Um, I've seen on numerous uh, job postings that I've met the minimum requirements, but some of those other requirements that I didn't meet was the reason why I didn't apply. So that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that clarification. Yes. You know, um, again, let somebody else tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. Let somebody else say it. Just go ahead and apply. You never know what may happen. You know, especially if you meet the minimum qualifications. You know? So this is what, if you um, look back on the original, uh, the page, oh, hold on. Uh, previous one. Oops, I'm going a little bit. All right, y'all, bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm trying to use a clicker. So I wanted to show you over here where it says veteran. I wanted to show you this is what comes up. It says if you are a veteran who served on active duty in the United States, in the U.S. United States Armed Forces and were separated under honorable conditions, you may be eligible for veterans preference as well as other veteran specific options. So this is gonna give you all the options about veteran preferences. Study it, let that become your Bible, make sure that you know, that you know which one you can qualify for and so on and so forth. All right, so this one is um, the next screenshot of how to apply. And so, like I said, here's like the Army Applicant Help Desk. Here's a website. Um, for this particular announcement, they're going to send you to their own portal in order to apply for this. So it will, won't look like the normal um, USA jobs. They're going to send you strictly to their portal, but you'll get notifications about um, the job via USA job, they link it together. So um, 
this is how you'll have, you know, where you'll have to apply. And then um, it just talks about next steps. But again, I, I cannot express, um, you know, enough of reading this in its entirety. One of the things I was sharing with Doug is that, you know, you need to have what we call an I love me binder. So I'm sure you have those with all your evaluations in it. Just make you another one to put in it, um, print off all of the job announcements that you um, apply for, what resume, you can just make a notation of which resume you um, submitted and when you submitted it and who you, um, you know, may um, follow up with. Um, because, you know, and, and I'm speaking to not only this usajobs.gov is a tool that really helps you manage it, but what, let's just say that you may apply for a position that's not USA Jobs. You just want to make sure you keep track of it and not do like, you know, um, some of us where we say, oh, I don't remember when I applied for that job. Oh, I applied for the job? Because it could be like sometimes 60 days before they call you. <laughs> and then you can forget, like myself. So I'm going to um, hand it over to Joe, and he's going to talk about the assessments right here, um, sections. Sure. Thank you, Sharman. So whenever you apply to a job, um, they have um, a self-assess, it's a self, um, self-screening. And basically, those, there's questions usually between five to 20 questions. Um, there's eligibility questions that you'll answer. Um, you know, asking if you're a U.S. citizen, asking you maybe some armed services questions um, to determine where, what your um, status is, your um, information, and then it's going to go into the job specific questions that are usually related to the duties of the job. And they're looking to, um, you're going to self-report your expertise. And you can see up here on the screen, there's a sample questionnaire. And it's going to have a series of questions and you're going to go through and you're going to pick the answer that best describes your experience. And one thing we want to make sure to point out is that your resume reflects what you're answering here. Um, don't copy and paste this in there, but make sure that when you're answering that you're answering truthfully, but make sure you're giving yourself um, credit. Um, we've seen people who've inflated themselves, made themselves look like they're an expert in everything. And then there's people who sell themselves short. They didn't really pay attention to the question. So um, this is the first stop. And I want to back up just a second here that when you're reviewing the announcement, it's important to read the announcement in its entirety. Um, there is to the right hand side when you're viewing the announcement on usajobs.gov. Um, it'll ask you if you want to apply to the job or if you want to save it for later. Um, you'd click that button to, to apply to the job. That's going to link all the information to your saved documents and your resume and carry you through that portal. Um, the other thing I want to point out too before that, um, as you were going through Charmin and explaining the USA jobs, the vacancy announcement, how it looks, um, we never want to say you can't apply to anything, right? It's if you feel that you've got, you look at a job and you feel you've got, you meet the, the specialized experience, by all means, apply to the job. Don't let somebody tell you you don't have um, what it takes for that job. Like Sharman said, let, let the others, let the um, HR specialist review your qualifications, your resume um, to determine if you can make it through um, to the, to be referred to a hiring manager. Um, the other piece with that too is um, not only, these are just examples. USAjobs.gov, when you go on there and you start to learn a little bit more, you wanna look at jobs that are open to US citizens. You wanna look and read who on the right-hand side, it's gonna say who may apply because um, veterans is just one piece that you're eligible to apply. You may be able to apply um, that are open to other who may apply sections. So. Just keep that in mind, um, don't limit yourself. And that in that who may apply section at the bottom of the announcement, um, that's usually when they have the contact information, that's a good source to go and reach out to via the phone or email to ask questions um, when you're applying to the, the announcement. And, and don't do the announcement 30 minutes before it's gonna close. I believe it's 11.59 Eastern time, which that sometimes trips people up. Um, 
but don't wait till the last minute because you're not going to get a response in time for that. That announcement's going to close and they're going to answer your question. It's going to be too late. Um, also in that announcement, um, and I can't remember exactly which section, um, there is a link to this questionnaire ahead of time. So if you save the announcement or you're reading through the announcement, you don't have time to go through and apply and you're curious about what questions you're gonna be answering, there's usually a preview of the questionnaire that you can click on and open and you'll see exactly what you're gonna be answering for that first step um, for going through and applying to this process. And so again, these assessments are set up um, the HR specialist works with hiring managers to develop the questions that they want in their announcement that they feel are related to the duties that you'll be performing on the job. And so you'll go through and answer that truthfully um, and making sure you self, self rate yourself um, with what experience you have and your expertise. That Thanks. part, once that part's, oh, no, I was you just want me to say, go on um, any further? Joe, if you could just, um, you know, are, explain the um, 9, 11, 12 step process as well. Um, Doug was uh, mentioning it in the chat and explaining it. Uh, yes, good afternoon. This is Joel Carvajal. I believe I got a missed call from Mr. Bustamante. I left a, a, Hello, uh, can you put your a message phone on earlier. mute? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> Joe, uh, could you uh -huh. explain? The 9, 11, 12 um, on this particular announcement here? Sure. So this particular job is looking for an executive assistant at the grades 9, 11, and 12. So what they're looking for is they're going to hire somebody. Well, they could have one or more vacancies. And again, don't be <laughs> discouraged if you see only one vacancy. They only have one vacancy open because when we put an announcement, we put a disclaimer. Um, stating that, you know, even though it's open for one vacancy, we can fill more vacancies using this announcement because other vacancies may come up, may be open. The 9, 11, 12, that's saying that I'm looking to hire somebody at the grade nine, a grade 11, or a grade 12. Um, if I bring in somebody who's qualified at a nine, um, they will have a full performance level of a 12. And that will be stated in the announcement. So you come in at the nine and then one year later, you're on a career ladder. Um, so you're a nine with a full performance level of a 12. So on the nine, you work for a year. If you're rated fully successful, you're eligible to um, go to the grade 11. And then one year at the grade 11, you perform fully successful. You're eligible then to be promoted to the 12, which will be your, your top grade level. And then we go into steps one two three four five so that's how you get increase in your pay um and then there is um depending on the the position i don't know this position itself but if they have that you can qualify based on um experience or education at the grade nine level that would usually mean that you need a master's um degree or I don't know all the specific language, um, X amount of years of graduate level education, that would automatically qualify you to be um, referred at the nine level. Um, the GS 11 would be a PhD um, degree that would automatically qualify you um, without having to look at your, your specialized or your qualifications in your resume. And then the 12 does not, um, we don't have education substitution at the grade 12 or higher. Um, did that explain what, did yes. that clarify a little bit more of that career yes. ladder? So there, if you see jobs, you'll see these 9-12 or 5-7, um, that's saying that this has got multiple grades and then you'll go down in the announcement, you'll see that it'll state the full performance level of the position, but it also in the announcement will show you, um, here's what we're looking for at the nine level. Here's what we're looking at the 11. Here's what we're looking at the 12. I will also state that where we've seen people fall short, when you apply to a job and we all want that big money, we all want that top level. We, you know, we think we're at this level. Sometimes you gotta kind of take it down a notch and say, you know, maybe they won't find me qualified at the 12. I'm willing to go to 11. I'm willing to take that because in a year I'll be a 12. 
Um, some people don't, there'll be a question that says, what's the lowest grade you're willing to accept? If you say you're only willing to accept a 12, you're not even gonna show up on their 9-11 list. You're not even gonna be looked at or referred, even though you have a master's degree that could have automatically qualified you at the nine. So stop and think about your situation and where you're willing to be flexible and you know, get yourself through. You know, Say your lowest grade would be a nine. You don't have to accept it. You can go through the whole process. You've got, it's up to you to say, yep, I'm gonna take this job offer and I'm gonna you know, start out at the nine. Um, so hopefully that helps. I know that those are just some of the points that I've seen before where people have fallen short and not moved forward in the process. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, I, hold on, let's see. So I put different um, screenshots on here of assessments because I wanted you um, to show that there's a difference of variances of questions that are asked. You have some that are, uh, please select the response below that best indicates how you meet the minimum qualifications of a nine level. And then it goes to the minimum qualifications of the GS 11 level. And then over here, there's a, um, a yes or no button. Um, question. So it says, do you have at least one year of specialized experience equivalent to the GS 11 level in federal service performing highly uh, responsible clerical administrative support functions and duties, managing and so on and so forth. And then the next set of questions is, it, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, as you see, there's like 20, 20 of them and it goes from A through E are the answers. So I just, you know, as Joe mentioned, there's a way that you can, um, there's a tab where you can um, review these questions in advance. So you don't have to rush through them while you're on, you know, in the tool. You can actually print these off, answer them a little bit more intelligently, think about them, meditate on them, you know, look at your resume where, you know, uh, these, these are very applicable and you can just, you know, have some type of, of uh, method to the madness, if you will. Um, because, you know, everything that Joe said, I was like, what? You know, um, I'm a lieutenant commander. I'm, <laughs> I'm a GS, you know, um, you know, 14. I'm going in straight as a 14. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, hey Sharma, I like that. And you're right. Look, look at Joe. You're right. That's what. Joe. <laughs> but I, I would say this too. Just taking this executive assistant as an example, and so I, for those that don't have a degree that are on the line right now, don't let this, you know, make you think that you know that hey, I don't stand a chance here, because if I think of this as an executive assistant, if you're working for a general or a admiral. Uh, or even a colonel, you know, and you're their executive assistant, and you've been doing that that type of job for the last 10 years, you know, working in the front office for a flag and doing travel and doing all those things, that experience will take you a long way and get you this. You'll qualify on the experience, not, not so much as the education if you don't have a degree. And uh, I'll, if I'm off on that, Joe, I'll let you chime in. I, I don't need, do you need me to answer anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to make sure I wasn't wrong. <laughs> on that. No, you're on the right track. Well, I so. think he's in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, that's uh, just an example. And then um, now, I just want you guys to think about, like, let's, let's switch caps now. Let, I want you to put, your hiring manager's cap on and we're going to look at a couple of examples and some information um, that's going to help you tailor that that resume and i'm i'm gonna and this you know it, it's not rocket scientists but it takes practice we don't i mean i i know i didn't get it right the first time shit the second time or the third time and I still, still need help now to this day. I need eyes, all eyes on deck 
when I'm looking at, you know, I'm not too proud to send my resume to anyone when I'm going through um, trying to get another position. I'm, but I'm, you know, just so you guys know, I'm happy with where I'm at right now because I get to like interact with you guys and Joe and Doug. And I mean, I, I have a, I have a dream job, if you will. Um, but anyway, so I just want you to change it. And I want you to think about um, the information um, it, that's in the resume and what might be useful and why and what would help you decide whether that candidate is the right candidate in the job. So here we go. Bam. So I will, um, hopefully, can everyone see this pretty clearly? Yes, yes, I can. All right. So it's a help desk technician, information tech, technology, division office, uh, office of management, office of inspector general, department of ha Homeland Security, it's a GS-7. They coordinate with vendors on service, replacement and upgrade of equipment, initiate and assist with final details of travel arrangement for senior and junior officer officials, edit, they draft, edit, review, finalize documents for senior level staff officials they purchase supplies with office uh purchase card from the uh, government vend vendors gsa advantage um hello direct etc they prepare documents presentation handouts for weekly monthly and all hands meeting maintain inventory databases of current and excessive equipment customer ticket as well as project updates prepare annual financial reports for managerial review to include FY 13, 14, 15 operating budgets. They provide uh, tier one technical software, hardware, and network resolutions to 700 plus nationwide users. And they facilitate various training sessions for the end, the end users, both individual and group sessions pertaining to the use of various hardware, software, and enterprise solutions. So they've done a lot. But as um, you know, we're gonna see here, that's the before, bam, here's the after. So you have the, the duties and accomplishments, like a little a blurb at the top. And then you have some two most notable, no, most the, the best accomplishments while you were there serving. So what I tried to do with this is that if you see the provide tier one, help desk service support was at the end of their accomplishments over here. Oops, hold on. Oh, all right, sorry. All right, so it was at the end here, right? But it's right. getting over here. And they put a little bit more meat on it by 170, 150, uh, 750. And it just made it flow a little bit different. And they added more um, impactful um, titles to it. And then down here, they also, you know, led the collection um, and facilitated. You know, you gotta, you know, even though you may be the um, administrative assistant or the admin assistant or the flag aide or the flag writer or what have you, you still are ensuring that your chain of command are able to do what they need to do. And so we just have to think a little bit differently in order to um, articulate this in a, in a way that, um, that best um, represents us um, for that particular job, if you will. So again, we have a percentage in here um, with a reduction. So it's about numbers and percentages, cause and effect. What did you do? How did you do it? What was the result of what you did? And what effect did it have on not just you, your program, your division, your company, but on the overall command as a whole? Um, sometimes we don't think like that when we're, um, in the midst of it, but one of my mentors always asked me, how do you know that you know that you're doing good? Well, I just know, well, no, you don't know HN that that's, that's, you know, subjective. You have to have more substantiated qualitative 
uh, analysis in order to articulate that. So, you know, I just impose on you guys just, you know, even after you get, um, when you make this transition to how do you know that you know that you're doing good, you know, and put measures in place in order to articulate that effectiveness so that you can come up with that 20% device reduction, um, you know, or estimate savings per month of 2,400 and, um, and, and whatnot. Oops. Oops. Sorry, y'all. All right. Any questions? And again, this isn't going to happen overnight. Um, it's going to take practice. Um, and it, and it's just, it's, it's not necessarily easy because this is not how we write, but I have to tell you that this is just, you know, we have to change that cultural mindset shift from these bullets to these bullets. So here's another one. Um, there, we, this is a GS 15. I think that's a program analyst. Joe is that 301 program analyst program manager. The 301 series. Um, it's more like, um, general administrative. Yeah. Mission support type person. Mission support. No, three. <clears throat> So in this one, you know, you see that the format is, is similar, um, but if, again, you know, in all of them, um, you're going to see in the after that it's a lot more meat and potatoes. And trust me, you, your, your supervisor um, knows the dollar amounts. Um, you know, there's a way to figure out your dollar amounts and be able to, um, and to sleep well at night. <laughs> and again, you'll have a copy of this um, at, um, for you to be able to look at it in, in, in more detail um, as well. I just want to mention, um, and I know that to some this might look like, holy crap, I got to fill in all this stuff. But um, if you read an announcement, you're you're trying to relate your experience for that position, um, whether that's the most recent job you have or it was a job you held five years ago or 10 years ago, when you think about the resume, um, that's where we talk about tailoring the resume. You you have like a master resume that has all your experience, has everything, and you're able to take now that new resume that you're gonna to tailor to this position and make it more focus based. So you may not have to carry over some information from your resume from jobs from the past that aren't relatable to getting that one year of specialized experience for that position. Because the HR and the manager is gonna look at specifically where do you have the one year of specialized experience to have this job at this grade level? Well, tell me where that is. So I know for me personally, I have a few different resumes on my USA job account that has a master. And then I have different ones tailored for different, um, for editing positions. So I have one that, you know, doesn't have certain positions on it because I know it's just not relatable. It doesn't matter. Um, what will matter is when you are selected and go through a background investigation, then you want to be able to provide obviously your history of where you worked. But when you're relating to the job, I know this looks like a lot, but it really isn't because you're, this is the juice. This is the heart of what you're trying to get at. This is what I want the HR specialist to hone in on. This is my one year of specialized experience and the HR manager to, to look at. And I just want to, you know, note that there are a lot of, I mean, we do a lot of collateral duty work in the, in, in, in the government, I mean, in, on active duty. And the job that I'm, I'm yes. holding is not even related to my degree. And I share that with you because I want you to know, um, I just want to be very transparent. 
My undergraduate degree is in HR. My master's is in educational leadership, and I'm a, an EEO specialist. And you're like, <laughs> well, one, when you become a JO, everybody goes to JAG um, to, uh, to the JO school to learn about equal opportunity. So, you know, I got the technical piece because I went to the training. I got the more practical piece when I had to do um, cases um, while on active duty. And then I went to Daomi and got my EEO Equal Employment Opportunity Certification and Special Emphasis Certification while I was still on active duty because they had me doing a job of Deputy Diversity Officer. And I was like, what in the world is that? Right? What, do, what do I do with that? And so I was like, I need some training. So one thing about the military is they're good with giving you training. So again, um, I'm in a position that it has nothing to do with my degrees. It all is due to collateral duty work that I did on active duty um, and experience. Um, so just I just share that with you all so that you know that collateral duty, volunteerism, all of that works and you can get these numbers in it. it. And again, you know, just like we have battle buddies, like I have a battle buddy, his name is Charles Thomas, and we <laughs> all the time about who, um, you know, about things. He's Army, I'm Navy. And so he's one that I share, you know, my, uh, as well as Doug, um, you know, things with in order to look at, to make sure that I'm sending out what the best thing. So I would, you know, we, we could be your battle buddies too. Um, but we're going to want, want you to make sure that you're, you have your, that before you send it to us, that we, that you've done a little bit, bit of battling yourself first so that we can make sure that, you know, we can, we don't want to fish for you. We want, we want you to fish for yourself. That's right. That's right. We want you all, you have to be all in. You have to be all in on this and you can do it. And these, but let, let, let me, let, let me just okay. jump on her okay. real quick, which is you, there were some key points that she made there that you need to understand, which is, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just about what you did while you were in the service. It's about what you did when you were off the volunteerism, that's something that, could, that you can relate to somebody else. But think about what you are doing before you joined the service. Many of you had jobs then. And many of those jobs are relatable to the things that you're, you, know, you may be interested in. And then on a final note, um, you're looking at your next career. And so just because you are a petroleum specialist in the Army doesn't mean that when you leave the Army, you have to be a petroleum specialist now. I was sharing um, earlier, and, I, and I'll probably talk more about that at the end, a petroleum specialist is in control of probably a football field worth of equipment. That translate, translates into, for me, I look at that, you know, I, I was in the Marine Corps for a time or two, so I remember, I know how much equipment that is. That's a warehouse examiner. But you won't think about that normally when you're looking for jobs. So when you start looking for jobs, start thinking about thinking outside the box about the areas you want to go to uh, just and look at everything and read through it. Because when you read through it, you'll see that, hey, I can kind of, I think I can do that. And then you have to take your skill set, the experience you have, and write it to fit that. Because if I'm looking at a warehouse examiner's uh, uh, criteria and I'm a petroleum specialist, as I look at all that, I said, okay, well, I control, you know, $50 million worth of equipment that I inventoried, I categorized, um, and I audited on a regular basis, you know, and I reduce, and then talk about the fuel, I could put all the metrics there for you. You know, you can do that you know, by taking it from petroleum specialist to warehousing. So just kind of, you got to think outside the box and what you're doing now won't be, and it's okay for it to be. You, you may enjoy this next phase of your career. So think outside the box and say, hey, this is what I really want to do. It's not this, I want to do that. All right. Um, so these are just, this is just an overview of, um, you know, of pretty much what we've, we've gone through for the past like hour and a half, I think. Yeah, hour and 20 minutes, 26 minutes. But one, you know, 
really important is understand that job announcement. Understand the job announcement, read it in its entirety, look over it, understand what, what it, how the hiring manager is going to consider and determine you the best candidate, the most qualified candidate for the job. So that goes, um, I cannot, you know, speak enough about um, reading that job announcement in its entirety. Um, I, um, reading is very fundamental and um, sometimes I, I, I forget that fundamental um, process when I was, I was going through it. Um, one of the things I also want to add that is not in here is um, informational interviews. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it, and I'll, I'll use this analogy, if you um, never ask for your curfew to be increased, you could still be coming in at the, in the house at eight o'clock uh, at, at night if you're 21. Right. But if you kept, if you asked and you every, every year you asked your parents, Hey, can I get 30 minutes? Can I get 30 minutes? Then guess what? The possibility of them saying yes is, is better than you not answering, asking the question at all. So I say all of that to say this is that ask for what we call informational interviews and an informational interview is just you going to going to that organization, networking, finding that, that, that person, whether it's through um, LinkedIn, whether it's through um, you know, social media, um, but presenting yourself in a way where you can ask for an informational interview and then do your homework and ask questions, you know, um, because that would weigh well with, um, with a hiring manager. In fact, it puts you in front of, in their face, for instance, you know, like, oh, they, you may be so impactful that they were like, oh, I remember this young man, this young lady. They actually came and sat down with me and, and took the time to ask me questions about my organization or what, how, what does it look like? What does the sec success look like for you? Um, this, that, and the other. You can ask them, you know, questions of, you know, how do you support your veteran transition um, program? Or what do you think about this? So you can do a little bit of homework and you can kind of ask them some questions as well. Um, so the second thing is, you know, again, gathering the information, um, the job announcements again, and then also the organizational website. You know, like for instance, you know, for, for me, for civil rights, I wanted to know what their um, management, management directive 715 looked like. Um, and what type of programs were they putting in place in order to mitigate or help increase the underrepresented population that was within the organization? Um, at the time that I came on board, we had this thing called Cultural Transformation Committee, and it was just really big with the previous administration. And we were, you know, doing some great things, and we're still doing some great things, but, it, you know, at least I was able to get in on knowing um, by looking at the organization's website. So I impose on you to, to definitely do your homework and research them just as much as they're gonna research you. <laughs> Again, pay attention to keywords and um, like I, and th those keywords are, are words like that I used, um, that I found to, in the effective phrases. Like I, if they said, you know, um, analyze, now I'm gonna use analyze in my resume. And for me, what I learned is that there's no way that one person is gonna be sitting through one uh, job announcement that may have a thousand applicants. So what they are, and this is just me sharmanizing, there probably is a computer that is probably picking up on this. So let me make sure that when I articulate my, my my skills and abilities that it has the similar words that is in the a job announcement. I, I may not use the exact word, but I'm gonna use something similar to the words. Joe or um, Doug, do you guys wanna speak on that? Nope. Joe? Um, well, I'll just, uh, yeah, I guess to, um compliment that. Um, one thing that I've, I've seen in my day as, um, as a specialist reviewing resumes that people have a title and they may be a supervisor or a leader and they have that in their title. 
And in the specialized experience that the manager's asking, one of their bullet points is, you know, provide me examples or provide me, you know, your experience as a leader, um, you know, and it may go on and on and on. And I review their resume as a supervisor or leader, and they make no mention of being what they're doing as a leader. Did they lead a group of 20? Did they lead them into battle? What did you do? What was your part of a group as a leader? Didn't mean that you had to be a supervisor. You could have been a leader of a group. Um, and so it's, yeah, using some of those key words to find out that the specialized experience is asking for um, analyzing, you know, documents using Microsoft Excel or whatever um, word. And then there's never any mention of, well, I analyzed documents, but never spoke of the different types of documents or software, any of that stuff. So, you know, just be mindful of that piece that just, I can't, a specialist can't infer what you're trying to, you know, you have to spell it out to us. So just because you have title of supervisor, you still need to put in some information in there that tells us what is it that you did. I, I agree with Joe in, um, but I also want to make a note, be, be very careful on your job title as you're coming out of the army. Um, because remember, you know, there, there are a lot of folks, if you're applying for different, well, if you're applying for a job um, and you're in the army, you know, I have Marine Corps experience and you're putting a title you had in the army and your organization, I may not understand it. And it may be a big organization that I need to understand. So first of all, try to figure out how to explain that title a little bit as you recap that title. Um, and second to Joe's point, he, he's right. When you, if it's asking for, um, and you're looking for, I'm looking for somebody to be a, a leader or a supervisor, then I'm gonna look for, I wanna make sure that, that how, I wanna know how many people you supervised, how many um, uh, appraisals you wrote, uh, if you have experience with discipline, uh, do you have experience on, on projects? How many projects do you manage? I, I'm getting into metrics now, as well as describing what you did, because if they're looking for that, for you to be a leader and a supervisor, they don't want a new supervisor. They want somebody with experience in it. And I know all of you have it, but you have to articulate. Um, if you just put some fluff words in there and move on to something else, and I don't see that, then your resume goes to the side and they're looking at the next one. Maybe this person got it right. All right. Yeah, you don't want to be too general or vague. You want to be able to provide that some specific information because uh, as a specialist reviewing the resume, that's the first, that's just the one stop. And then when they do review and qualify and refer, then it does reach to the hiring manager, Doug's level, who's going to look at that again, and he's going to know more about that job, the more ins and outs of what he's looking for. And there's times where the hiring manager does go back to the specialist, like, how did you move this person forward? I'm not seeing it. And so you want to be able to be very clear on what you're stating in your resume, because it doesn't just stop at a specialist reviewing to move you on. It's going right to that hiring manager who's going to call you for that interview. So if you've, you know, um, hyped up your responses in the questionnaire and then hyped up stuff in the resume or didn't put enough in there, that's where they're going to find out. And it's either going to be a no, a go or a no, um, moving any forward for that position, um, based on what you got in that, that resume to, you got to be able to speak to that when you start answering those interview questions. All right. So, um, the, the, this next slide talks about, um, getting started and thinking about how you're going to qualify for the job. And I think we spoke a, a, um, enough on this is that, you know, your paid and unpaid experience, your educational level and your training. Um, those are the ways that you're going to get evaluated, primary ways that you're going to get evaluated um, or qualify for um, the position. So somebody asked, um, have you ever used job scan? And then there was also a question about um, hot button words. Uh, is there a resource for current ones? I would say, and, and Joe, you could, you, you could, you're probably a little bit more versed on this. There's no um, hot button, if you will, of what current words are used. I think those hot buttons is in 
the a job announcement because every job announcement is going to be different and going to ask for different things. So you got to know how to identify those words within the job announcements when they talk about the requirements. Um, and I've never used job scan um, for or, or any kind of sc scanning uh, tool prior to submitting my resume. I just submitted my resume. I just know that there's just a lot of people applying for jobs and there's just no way that one person's going to be able to do it. So they have to have some type of mechanism in order to, 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 you know, to go through. So, um, that's just my two cents. Joe, you want to add anything? Yeah, there's no, um, specific hot button or keyword. Um, obviously, like you said, those specialized experiences are different, different positions. Um, you could have the same position, but different hiring managers, um, different units, different areas, they may have to, they, in the cons consultation pay, uh, piece, when they're creating the questionnaires, they're also working with managers to develop that specialized experience based on the duties, the job skills, the abilities of that job. So they're creating those specialized experiences. So sometimes you'll see they're very standard. And then there's other times where they need to have a few unique identifiers for that type of position, maybe the region, um, certain things are different. So there's no one specific keyword. It's just paying attention to what is it that they're looking for because the specialist is going to have the resume up on one screen and they're going to have that specialized experience up on the other and they're going to be looking back and forth at those bullet points and looking at your resume to identify where you meet the minimum qualifications to be referred to the manager. We don't use um, a system that scans resumes for keywords or anything. Every resume that when you, um, depending on how you're applying um, and the batch of people that they're looking at that make it onto the list of people to be reviewed, um, uh, someone is actually looking at the resume and reading. So it's good to be able to pinpoint your experience, make it so it's easily identifiable um, to the specialist and the hiring manager. So they're not having to read through and find that you on the second page, that's where you're starting to hit the mark on things. Um, you want to be able to highlight that where it's easily identifiable quickly. Um, but yeah, someone's actually reading those resumes. Uh, I would say, if you can hear me, the, the biggest difference and the biggest value in job scan is going to be for those civilian jobs. Um, because like Joe said, the biggest difference between civilian uh, resumes and federal hiring, right? There's physically a person reviewing your federal resume, those specialists, and that is not always the case in civilian resumes. Majority of hiring companies in the civilian world are first utilizing that applicant tracking system, hence where you would want to use your job scan resource um, before that resume ever gets in front of a pair of eyeballs. Um, keep in mind for job scan, you do only have five free scans a month. So be selective about those resumes to job postings that you're going to try to cross at. We never want you to pay for anything, so utilize uh, this resource smartly. And I'll just jump on that, that with usajobs.gov, there's no limit. You can apply to as much as you want, <laughs> when you want. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, th there's no limit to apply. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> the next um, um, slide talks about the style of resume. And so for the federal resume, it is a combination of chronological as well as function. So you want to make sure your experience is, is, is chronological from present um, experience um, to the least uh, present um, experience, I, I suppose. I don't know if I said that right. Um, but from from the, the, the most relevant, the most, what you're currently doing and what you've done in the past. And then those, and functional means that it is re, um, related to the particular job that you're applying for. So, you know, um, you know, chronological, yes, I may have served on a ship, but what particularly did I, what duties can I extract from being stationed on that ship is relevant to being a e equal employment opportunity specialist. 
I had to change my mindset. Even though I was the, um, at, you know, the admin officer, but what of those admin officer duties was relevant to that job announcement? So that's where that functional piece came in, but then it was chronological um, in a sense of, okay, I went from this job to this job to this job, but these are the functions that was relevant, relevant to that particular job announcement. Um, and then the next one is uh, write about your experience. The experience section should demonstrate the quali quality of your experience, the complexity of your work that you perform, your independency um, that you work, and the extent your experience is related to the targeted job and any outcome awards recognition. So that numbers and percentages, cause and effect um, is, is where that comes into place. And then here is it, frame your experience as an accomplishment. And then final, you know, I can never express, um, every time I look at my resume, I always find something on there that I missed, um, to, to be honest. Um, so you always want to review. And then again, if you build your resume in the resume tool, you're gonna have those outlined, those, it's gonna be outlined in the headers that, um, that the federal resume um, is looking for. Um, and then again, includes your accomplishment and any special projects. And here is like use plain language. So plain language is if you have any acronyms in there, please spell out your acronyms first, and then you can use it later um, in your uh, in your in in your writing. But make sure you spell it out first, and then put your little you know the parentheses behind it. Um, but also, if it's you know, if you need to articulate it in a, in a way that um, is relatable to the civilian sector, um, you also need to be mindful of that too, because some people don't, you know, may not know what a battalion is. So you're going to have to say you supervise how, I mean, um, Doug, how many people are in a battalion? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, but I know battalion is big, right? It, it, it depends on the service, but uh, uh, 1,200. See, so that's that's enormous. So for 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 me, you know, um, non Marine Corps servant, uh, hospital corpsman here, fire hospital corpsman, I, I don't, I didn't, I had no clue what you know, twelve hundred people, but that's a lot, um, and you need to be able to make sure that's articulated, and then focus on quality. Nice. And here is just well written, clean. Address your specialized requirements again. Mistakes in grammar, punctuation. Um, this is different than what we use. We use choppy language um, in our um, fitness reports. Um, uh, we don't use full sentences. So you have to change your mindset and make sure that you're grammatically correct and your punctuations. And there's lots of tools out here with the advent of technology and our friend Google. Um, you, they're like Grammarly can help out with, uh, you can cut and paste it, put it in Grammarly, make sure it's spelled right um, and things of that nature. And so, let's see, let's see if there's somebody in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Dustin. And, and this is just a, the, high, the federal hiring process. So first you're gonna have the, you know, you see the job announcement, then you have your resume and the application that you're gonna submit. And then you may, you know, then next in the hiring process is if you make the cert, you're gonna get that you made the cert. And then you you may hear um, if you however high up, and Joe, you, I need you to chime in on this <laughs> because I can make the cert. And I've made plenty of certs, but I've never gotten a call for the interview. And then I'll go back to USA Jobs and it'll be like, you were not hired. <laughs> so, Joe, if you could please chime in and explain that process um, a little sure. bit better than I, I did, um, I would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so when you, um, as she said, as you go to the announcement, your resume, you apply to the job. Um, and they review resumes, then they determine who makes a, the cert is a certificate of eligible. And depending on the type, how the hiring path was announced, the announcement was announced. So that could have been 
um, whether it was to all U.S. citizens or if it was a merit promotion and it had specific hiring authorities that they were allowing to apply. Um, a manager does not have to um, interview everyone on a certificate. They, they can now, they'll look at the certificate of eligibles, they'll look at the resume and they'll determine, okay, this is who I wanna interview. Um, they can pick and choose who they wanna interview. Um, or they can say, I don't wanna, none of these look really that great. And then they make no selection and they return unused. Um, one key point I will point out though, is that with all US citizens or positions that use veterans preference, um, for all US citizens, we, when you fall into the best quali quality category, um, a hiring manager cannot, they can interview people, but they cannot select a non-vet over a vet. So if I've got one interview, a certain amount of people, um, if anybody has anything. So hey, this is uh, Greg Jones. I had a question for you. Um, how do you, how would you recommend approaching if you're wanting to claim veterans points, but you don't have um, the documentation yet? For example, if you're retiring, you won't find out what your disability rating is until the day, you know, the day after your last day in the military. So how do you articulate that to potential employers that, hey, I've got, you know, 10 veteran preference points coming, I just don't have the paperwork yet. So we have a, a statement of service document that you would have right. filled out? Sorry, did I get cut off? No, no I, I was gonna, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it's the, it's the statement of service. Actually, the law requires us to uh, not penalize an active duty person when they're applying for a job, and we want to make them a selection offer. So we, um, you go to your battalion commander or your admin, and somebody signs a bi-direction letter that says that you have honorably served and you're expected to be. Uh, discharge on that on that date um, and so be, so there are a number of different laws and acts that have, that apply the VRA uh, and the VEOA uh, that you can be brought in under uh, even without the disability letter um, some of the, it may require that and some don't um, and for a HR specialist they would need that before you're brought on board but I believe that they can give you, and Joe can chime in here and tell me if I'm off on this, a tentative selection letter dependent upon uh, when you get your, uh, your disability letter in, if we're gonna bring you under that specific criteria. But we have, matter of fact, we hired a guy in our livestock and poultry program, a veterinary technician out of Hawaii, uh, active duty captain in the army. And uh, he had, uh, I want to say four months left on active duty, and he was selected, and we brought and we gave him a selection letter, uh, and then when his discharge, he came to this area, to the D.C. area, and we brought him on board. Uh, we did not use his disability for that. We used, uh, I think that's the VRA uh, to select him, and he was selected non-competitively. Right. No. Yeah, I understood. I understood that. Uh, well, I understand the VRA, um, the process. I was just saying is so. If there was two people that were retiring, um, but one was not going to have a disability versus, and the other one was knew he was going to be able to qualify for the, you know, the additional disability points. How does he articulate that or prove that he's, you know, going to get a VA rating when he gets out? Well, so the, the key point here is what you're saying is, and what Joe has said was, as you're you're both counted, you're both counted as veterans, and so you both need to be looked at. We can't hire a non-veteran over you, so you both would need to be looked at. So, Doug, I think what he's am I off on that? Joke? Doug, can you hear me? Carmen, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I went away. My stuff. Was I can now. Okay, cool. Um. So what I believe that the, the um, gentleman was asking is not based on being a veteran, based on your disability status. And I don't think that you, 
well, there is no possible way that you're going to actually know what your disability rating is until you go through the C&P process and they actually rate you. You may think you have something and depending on where you at and who's doing it will determine what your VA status, you know, your, your disability status is. You know, I've gotten out and, you know, I've got folks that you know, <laughs> serve with that we may have some similar challenges. It all depends on how you articulate it, who's, who's actually doing the exam, if they're veteran friendly at the VA, if they understand you, what you're going through, if you had the right exams. So you can't get privileges based on assumptions. You got to have that certificate beforehand. If that answers your correct, Sharma is correct. So there's, there's, yeah, there's. So there's two routes. If you're getting a medical board, you're required by law to know what your rating is before you're out of the military. The other side is if you're just retiring by law, the VA will not tell you what your disability percentage is until the day after your last day in the military. Well, that's the that's when the process starts. Um, no, the process. The, the so the process with the VA starts 100, 180 days out. And I only right. really know this because my 180 starts on the 5th of March or the 5th of May. Right, but they're not going to submit your package until the day that you're out. Like, which will, which helps. Um, so, they, so they've updated it now. So they, oh, they try have? to get it to you before you get out. Yeah, they try to get it to you as soon as you retire. But if you've got a lot of medical stuff, then it depends on the rating because once you go from 90 to 100 percent that's that's the game changer on the va side of the house okay thank you um the only other slides and i don't know why i'm not able to um oh share my screen again <laughs> okay thanks so i thought that was just me nah it, it wasn't just you um so anyway doug there, there there's your slide partner Okay, so I, I get to close that. So I, I want to uh, just a, a couple of key points that we're we're getting in, we're getting to the uh, to the end of our presentation. So first, I, I want to talk about um, the very many opportunities we have in USDA, and I talked briefly about a petroleum specialist, you know, uh, coming out of the service and looking at warehouse being a warehouse examiner or even being um, uh, a commodity grader, which is you know, our bread and butter in agriculture marketing service. But we have, uh, we're, 100, we're over 100,000 people in um, the Department of Agriculture. If you have experience in contracting, uh, we can't keep them. So if, you, if, you're, if you're a COTAR, a contracting, op, uh, contracting officer's technical representative, you know, then you can qualify for many of our jobs here, Kansas City, uh, Colorado, and other places uh, around. Uh, if you've worked in a budget office, you know, we have a need for you. If you put up utility poles, if you're a combat engineer or engineer support person, and you put up utility poles and you think, okay, I'm going to get out of the Army. I, I can't do that anywhere else. We have a huge organization called Rural Development. And guess what? They are critically short of that specialty. If you've written grants before, reviewed grants, uh, if you, you know, if you are, you know, you saw up there, executive assistant, we got a, a person coming from Fort Belvoir on the Skill Bridge internship, be interviewed right now to be an executive assistant to one of our one-star equivalents. And by the way, Randall Jones, who was up here before, was on the, on the line before, I should have started off by telling you, he's a two-star equivalent. And so that's just how important it is, you and your next chapter in your career is to us. There is not one job in the military that cannot transition somewhere in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have investigators, we call compliance officers. We have huge IT. You can't get enough of IT people. Uh, I talked about loans, grants, real Real estate, we do more in USDA when it comes to uh, uh, rule of uh, home loans, uh, those things and other things. Public affairs, our entire public affairs shop, uh, 
with the exception of two people, are all military veterans. And the leader, she's not a military veteran, but she's a military brat. Her father is still on active duty in the Navy. So we are very military friendly and we are looking for you. Now, I'm gonna tell you about my journey real quick as we get ready to close this out. I, when I retired from the Marine Corps, my first job was as a contractor. And I went back to the Marine Corps and I worked as a contractor. And, and it was shipbuilding, believe it or not. Um, and then I left that and I went to the Marine Corps and took a GS-15 position at the Pentagon. Now, I've been at USDA for over 10 years. I saw a job and it was the Associate Deputy Administrator for Poultry Programs. I looked at it and I read, this is what Charmin and Joe were talking about. I read the announcement. My wife read the announcement. She says, she told me, she saw, I saw it, she saw it, she came to me and said, that, Doug, that sounds just like you. This sounds just like you. That job is the number two person in charge of all the grading of that double A stamp or that A, that grade A stamp you see on eggs, on chickens, you know, uh, that's what that job was all about. Graders throughout the entire United States. Um, and I read it and it's, it sung all the things that I had done throughout my career in the Marine Corps and even before the Marine Corps. Applied for the job, went for a one hour interview, was in the office for three hours with the guy I, wor I was gonna work for. Three hours and got the job. And now my degree, is in, I got a minor in engineering, but I, my degree is in uh, uh, parks and recreation. I had planned on working for the National Park Service when I got out of college. Completely 180, and in the Marine Corps, I'm a logistician. That's what I did in the Marine Corps. Completely different than what I'm doing now. Now I'm the uh, Associate Deputy Administrator for Science and Technology. This is you. So look at your next career and think about where you wanna go and do that. So, um, let me just tell you this, as you, <clears throat> um, Kristen's gonna get on here and she's gonna talk to you, but I wanna leave you with a tagline. As you send her your resume to, uh, and it gets ready to come our way, we have a tagline, AMS USO. So if you, if you got a pen and paper, write that down, AMS USO. We wanna keep track of you. So as your resume gets you know, primed up and ready, even if you apply for a job, and you send us, you know, because I'm, I'm going to be sending out a, a notice to all of the folks on here about a, a couple of jobs we're looking for. And they're in Tucson, Arizona, and in Fort Worth, Texas. And it's for a marketing specialist. And it's going to be, it's being non-competitively announced. And so, but when you apply for it, for those that apply for it, put on their AMS USO in the subject line so that we know that you attended this. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. If you have other questions and we miss you after this, please let us know and send them, you can send them to Kristen and, or, uh, and we'll get back to you and answer uh, your questions. Hey, back Dad, you. You go. we have a question coming in from the chat about how folks can apply for internship opportunities through the USDA. Um, specifically, this individual is a retiree. Uh, we don't have, let's say for the active duty, we have the skill bridge and the operation warfighter. And I'm proud to say we're, we're very active in those uh, internships. And so if you're still on active duty and, and got less than, um, and got at least uh, three months left on active duty, preferably six months, we'll bring you in operation warfighter. We can bring you in to do that. For if you're a retiree and you're interested in becoming a commodity grader, we have an apprenticeship program here in Fredericksburg, Virginia for positions throughout the United States. Uh, and that's when I say a commodity grader, you're the person that would grade over 169 uh, different types of crops such as apples, oranges, peanuts, cucumbers, uh, basically fruits and vegetables and some other specialty crops. That's an apprenticeship program that we have available uh, for those that are out I don't think, and Joe, you have to chime in here, that we have anything for retirees, people that are already out of the service other than that apprenticeship. Well, Doug, we have a, um, yeah, I, oh. a volunteer program, um, but through the volunteer services, um, I have to look into some more information about that, but um, 
I know when we're doing our student interns, they, they bring some students in on a volunteer basis, which is non-paid, of course. But um, Joe, did you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head besides our Pathways internship for people who are currently enrolled in school that we have those internship opportunities, the recent grad. Um, I'd have to look further into that, any of the, any other internships? Yeah, like we, we, you know, here in the, you know, the, the DMV area, we have what's, what's called the um, Summer Youth Employment Program, but of course that goes up to um, uh, folks that are like 24 years of age, it's paid for by the government, um, Prince George's County, as well as the DC, um, the city of DC pays for their salaries. And we work with those organizations, but I know that there was a gentleman last year that his dad knew someone um, knew knew someone um, over at the department. And he just got an internship under the volunteer program. He just that's how I was like, well, what program did you come on? And he's like, well, my dad, you know, you know, knows this person, and he came in under the volunteer um, realm, where you know, um, like if you wanted to go volunteer at the hospital, you'd have to go through the volunteer services department. So we, you know, we have that um, opportunity as well. But again, it's it's not it's mostly for people that are local. Um, but I would I would also you know if you want to volunteer um, or or get some experience, then that that's what that informational interview is shadowing. Um, if if you're in the area where you can do that. Well, well Sean, I, I, I would say if if, you, if you're retired and you're looking for a job because it looks like you're looking to work at USDA and you're if you're looking for a job at USDA apply for jobs. I mean, we can, we'll, we can find a way. We have a multitude of opportunities, you know, which we had said earlier, there's a way for you to get on board. So um, it doesn't matter what, if you're, you know, uh, no matter what grade you come in, we can get you in under a, uh, uh, maybe one of those career ladders we had talked about earlier. So, but if you're still on active duty, the skill bridge internship and the operation warfighter uh, internship, those are huge opportunities that we are exploiting huge, uh, uh, very much throughout the Department of Agriculture, so. Hey, Douglas, this is uh, Greg Jones, just for everybody's understanding. So SkillBridge is a DOD level entity. Um, depending on your service, they may call it something else. Um, and secondly, most services, so like the Army, their internships only are authorized up to 90 days. However, you can tap into the SkillBridge program, which authorizes up to 180 days, but that requires some extra administrative stuff because you have to clear and do all other kinds of stuff before you start that internship because it's 180 days long and you can only start it 180 days out from your retirement date or your EPS date over. So that, that's a good point, Greg. Uh, it's all dependent upon your um, the base that you're at, number one. And number two, uh, something that Charmin had said earlier, always ask because they may say no, but then again, they may say yes. We can work that out. You can work that out with your command and say, hey, look, I got it. For example, if you got if you're a soldier and you and you've got a home in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, you want to do your skill bridge internship, you talk to your commander and say, "Look, I got a chance for a permanent job up there in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'd like to go up there for six months to do that." Um, put your paperwork in. Yeah, your general's got to sign it, but you know you got a good chance of him saying yes. There's a chance it may say no, but if you don't ask, it won't happen. They'll be coming in the house at eight o'clock. <laughs> um, I just wanted to chime in too, and just to, I know we've. Oh. Go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. I was just going to chime in and just mention one more thing that I know when we were talking about specialized experiences and education and qualifying education um, and these internships, we have a plethora of jobs that you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to be in college. Like you, you can come into the the government for a position um, based on 
experience alone. You don't have to be in school or have had a degree for many, many jobs. So I don't, hopefully that message was not, um, I know we just kept talking about education and degrees and stuff. I didn't want them to think that we're just looking for degrees and experience that for those who haven't attended college yet or just in the middle of it or whatever. All right. Okay. Um, that is, those are direct communication lines to Doug and me. <laughs> um, so again, <laughs> we're going to um, turn it over to Kristen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so very, very much, but hold on because I think Kristen may have a few words to say as we close it out. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Charmin. Thank you all so much for being here today. I hope you saw the value add that um, AMS was able to bring to you in your transition journey, whether you are still active duty, um, a veteran or a military spouse. This is just an example of one type of program that the USO Pathfinder program offers. Um, I know our friends from the Pathfinder program out at Hampton Roads are on the line as well as Colorado Springs. So you can see that we have a national touch. Um, if you are interested in receiving additional assistance from the Pathfinder program, um, I will drop our link in the group chat. It's very simple. Go to uso.org slash Pathfinder and you'll connect with the scout that way. Um, you see me chatting folks in our chat over there about have you asked your scout about this? Uh, have they sent you this? They have this on hand for you. Um, that scout is your dedicated transition specialist. I have my team on the line right now um, that is going through this training with you. So they're learning all the ins and outs um, from Doug and Charmin and Joe alongside you. So they are just another piece of this whole transition puzzle that we play a small part in. And we are also going to be hosting um, more virtual workshops as we navigate this new normal. So mock interviews, um, entering different types of industries, tech space, um, a lot of those roles that can be 100% virtual for however long we find ourselves in this situation. So um, be sure that you're following us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and better yet, sign up for our Pathfinder program, uso.org slash Pathfinder and connect with a scout that way because that scout is your personal accountability partner and their job is to ensure that you're successful. I will put my email in that group chat as well. If you have any feedback about this event, if you would like to sing praises to Joe, Doug, and Charmin, um, please send them to me or them directly. Thank you again, AMS, the entire USDA team for carrying the load here and you made this workshop possible to over 55 participants so thank you again everyone um, any questions use the chat i'll put my email there you have have doug and Sharman's as well um, be safe and stay healthy all right thank you thanks kristen and thank you, you. and thank you everybody for coming on board hey it was a pleasure to serve you all we are here for you. All right. Any last? Yes, we are. Any last parting uh, things? Going once, going twice. We're out till the next time. It's a pleasure. You guys stay safe. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.